um, as we get back into here, uh, again, we have uh, crossed the border into Oklahoma, which is the fourth leg of our trip. And actually, we're now just about a third of the way uh, finished through uh, the 66 books of the Bible. By the time we get out of Oklahoma, we'll be over halfway through uh, the Bible. So, you know, you're, you're uh, uh, getting the whole load here, and uh, we're going to keep plugging along. And by the way, when I'm gone, isn't it great? Biff and Dave both did a fabulous job, and uh, I sure appreciate that. So, all right. Um, in Oklahoma, you might remember our, uh, our first little stop on uh, Route 66, and I'm taking you up here to the corner of the state where we are. Uh, but our first state was uh, there in Commerce and uh, the home of Mickey Mantle, little tiny little town. And today, uh, we're going down the road to Miami. You know, it's not Miami. It is Miami. And uh, I, I, at least that's what the books I read said. And uh, it's named after uh, the Indians. And the Indian tribe was called Miami, not Miami. It's kind of like the tomato-tomato thing, I guess, you know. I've noticed, have you ever noticed Dave says Route 66 and I say Route 66? And uh, I'm from Missouri, but he thinks I'm from Missouri. You know, it's just kind of all depends where you live, I guess. But, uh, but the, technically, the, uh, the right uh, pronunciation, apparently, of this little town is Miami. And uh, Main Street, right down Main Street is Route 66, and they've actually, as you can see, built a little gateway here, gateway to Route uh, 66, and it's a little bit uh, larger town. If you remember, Commerce was a pretty tiny little town. Miami is a little bit of a larger town, and a couple of things that we would want to do if we were actually on a trip through here, uh, one is that it has a vintage motorcycle museum. So uh, for all of you that uh, like that sort of a thing, like I do, uh, this would be a fun place to stop. There's actually uh, a couple of pictures. This is a 1917 Harley. That was 100 years ago. Isn't that amazing? 100 years ago. So, uh, and then uh, this was a uh, 1919 Indian racer, and that, those, that wood behind it, they used to race on oval wooden tracks. And so that's a little piece of that. So that would be a nice stop. And then, of course, we'd probably be real hungry. And so we'd head down the road to Cuckoo Burger. You know? And uh, you know, if you've been on Route 66, you have to tell everybody that you went to Cuckoo Burger. I, am I the only one that's into this this morning? By the way, I'm just kind of curious. OK, all right, all right. So our corresponding book. Uh, of the Bible uh, is the book of Jeremiah, the second of what are called the major prophets, and uh, it is loaded, and uh, we're going to uh, push through uh, this book together this morning. Actually, I want to pray for a second. Lord, I just pray that as we look at Jeremiah, and particularly as we look at specific texts in there, uh, that you would use this in our lives, that you would make it come alive, that you would speak to us so that we could respond to you. In your name, Jesus, amen. So the book starts out, quite simply, the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anatoth in the territory of Benjamin. Let me give you a little bit of a historic background to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, first of all, uh, simply his name, uh, in Hebrew, uh, his name is Yirmayahu, and the shortened form of that, Yirmaya. Uh, Hebrew does not have a J sound in it, by the way, so it's kind of funny that we have so many, uh, our English translations, so many of them, even Jesus. I mean, Jesus was Yeshua, because they didn't even have a J sound. But anyway, and the meaning of his name, of course, uh, originally in the Hebrew was bullfrog. Uh, this is a joke, all right, uh, yeah, I know. You, you, did you watch Biff and I? You know, we, we were having fun. All right, actually, uh, the meaning of his name is that the Lord lifts up or exalts. An interesting name for Jeremiah because when you read the book, um, you know, from God's perspective, one of the things that really struck me this week is that um, his definition of what it means to be exalted or to be successful, I think, is quite different from ours, and we see that in the life of Jeremiah. Now, to place him, by the way, uh, in his context, remember, well, actually, remember back to when we looked at the uh, divided kingdom of Israel. So after the third 
King Solomon, there was that civil war, uh, and Israel split into two, the northern kingdom Israel, southern kingdom Judah. And it's important because as we go through the prophets, they're constantly going to be making reference either to Israel or to Judah. They aren't arranged chronologically, so sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. But remember that in 722 BC, the Assyrians, they just devastated the northern kingdom and uh, basically annihilated it. And so after that, all you really had, uh, uh, and Jeremiah, he's going to fit in after that. So the northern kingdom is already gone by the time Jeremiah begins. He actually is almost a hundred years after that. And remember, Isaiah was a contemporary uh, of that destruction of Israel. So Jeremiah, we're a hundred years further down the line than we were when we looked at the prophet Isaiah. And again, one of the things that can be a little confusing when you read through the prophets is just that it's not uh, structured chronologically. And so Jeremiah, he, he becomes a prophet uh, to the south, to Judah, and kind of specifically to Jerusalem. And, and everything in the prophet, if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to try and read ahead when we're, uh, you know, going through these books. But everything in Jeremiah is really targeted on what is getting ready to happen to the southern kingdom during the time of Jeremiah's ministry. So um, he begins in what is kind of a time of reform. Uh, we're told this in the second verse. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Well, we can specifically uh, you know, zero in on that because uh, Josiah began his reign in 640 B.C., so we know that when Jeremiah began to prophesy, uh, this, his reign was already, he was already 13 years uh, into his reign. And uh, th there's some significance to that. One of the things is, is that, that Josiah was actually a king under whom reform took place. But reform didn't take place until the 15th year of the reign of Josiah. So I have to think that some of what uh, perhaps Jeremiah said here had some kind of an influence. I mean, in many ways you feel like he prophesied for 40 years and nobody ever listened to him. That's kind of the sense you get. But, but there was this small period of reform. But after that, there was a period of decline. And what happens, and, and the tone of this, I think the tone of the book uh, reflects this, is that, uh, that most of what he's dealing with is a period in the history of Israel where they have really gotten off track again. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the writers I was reading this week referred to this period of time as the most tragic national record ever written. And of course, it's contained in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, where we've already been, but it talks about uh, you know, what happened during some of these reigns. And, and another one of the writers I was reading this week uh, referred to him then that, that Jeremiah became the prophet of Judah's midnight hour. And so here he is, it's the last five kings of the southern kingdom uh, that, are, that he is prophesying all the way up till uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and really just a little bit past that. But again, he tells us that, uh, that he, his ministry was through the reign of Jehoiakim down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah when the people of Jerusalem went into exile, and we have we know the date on that, 586 BC. So the 40 years between 627, 26, 28, and 586, which puts him right at the kind of at the end uh, of the first batch of prophets. Usually, uh, another way that the prophets are divided is that at some of the prophets are called pre-exile 
prophet, so Isaiah would be a pre-exile prophet, meaning that their ministry and their message was before the destruction of Jerusalem. And then we're going to see, uh, even in our next few weeks, how that there are certain prophets that are called exile prophets, so they are actually ministering during the time that Judah is in captivity, that the Jews are in captivity. And then, of course, you know from going through this part of the history that, that after 70 years, uh, they come back you know, to, uh, to Israel, at least a remnant, and rebuild uh, the city. And so those prophets are called post-exilic. So uh, Jeremiah, again, right at the very end of those uh, pre-exile prophets. And the theme, because of that, uh, and this will just be repetitive and recurring throughout the book, the theme really is a theme of destruction, but also restoration. You know, when we looked at Isaiah, we said the big themes of Isaiah were, were judgment and uh, salvation. And, and in a sense, this is the same kind of a message, but it's so specifically about this destruction that's coming. And the, the reason I put that in bigger letters than restoration is because most of the book is about the destruction piece. And there's these very little hints throughout about the restoration. We'll, we'll see both of those as we go through the book. Well, the, the book begins, really, uh, after this brief introduction. Oh, let me just say this. It's a very difficult book to, uh, to get a structure on. It is a compilation of a, a whole bunch of prophecies that Jeremiah gave. And for whatever reason, again, when the, they were pulled together almost like an anthology, which is true of, of, of not only him, but other of the prophets also. But when they pulled it together, for some reason, they just pulled it together in a way that even inside Jeremiah, there's no chronology. So it's jumping around all over the place. One minute, it's kind of at the beginning of this period, and then he'll jump all the way to Zedekiah, and then they'll come back to another. And so it's a really hard book to sort of give some structure to in order to understand it. But the one thing that we can use, to, and this is what I'm going to do this morning, is that we really can take it and talk about the fact that a large part of the book takes place before the destruction of Jerusalem, and then another part of the book takes place after the destruction of Jerusalem, and that's the way we'll approach it, before the fall of the city, after the fall of the city. So part one, uh, again, will be uh, before the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, this part of the book uh, really starts out in, in one of the, this is really cool, I, I like uh, both in Isaiah and Jeremiah, we get a little taste of, of what it was that God did that called them into their ministries. And the first chapter of Jeremiah, you know, contains that. Um, and we looked, oh, well, let me say, I don't want to do that yet. Let me get back here. Okay. Um, the first three verses tell us a number of things. One, uh, no, I did want to do that. Okay. <laughs> they tell us that Jeremiah is from a town called Anatoth, and uh, that, uh, again, is a very compressed little map there. You can see Bethlehem is only five miles south of Jerusalem, Jericho 15 miles from Jerusalem, and Anatoth was about four miles north of Jerusalem, and his dad was a priest, which meant his dad would have been spending a lot of time in Jerusalem. The fact that he tells us that his dad was a priest tells us something about Jeremiah also because at this time in Israel's history, certainly, um, if you were a priest, it was like being part of the nobility uh, of, of the nation and the priestly class tended to be uh, educated. So Jeremiah probably was a, a relatively uh, educated uh, young man, and they tended to be privileged. Although what is going to happen to Jeremiah is that he, his, he's going to lose being privileged. He's really going to be someone that throughout uh, these 40 years is, uh, is really persecuted, and, and life is hard for him. But in terms of his background, uh, he came from that. Probably a long ministry, I mean, we know it was a long ministry, probably young when he started, uh, because he says that in verse 6, and we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. So here's the actual call. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, 
Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Um, oh, okay, that's it. By the way, this is, a, uh, this is a text that you could personalize. This isn't the message I'm getting to this morning. But do you realize that God could, could say that to every single one of us in, in this room? That, that before we were formed in the womb, God already uh, knew us, had planned us, and, uh, and knew uh, what, what we were going to be like. He, he wove us together, David says in Psalm 139. And, and how about before you were even born, God set you apart for something. And, uh, and I think part of what we want to do in our life is we're always trying to, you know, get our hands on, okay, what, what is it that God wants me to do? And when we discover that, you know, part of what's going on is the very thing before we were even formed in our mother's womb that God had created us for. And for most of us, we won't be appointed as a prophet to the nations, but there's a blank in there that somehow each one of us could fill in in terms of what is it that God has appointed us to do. So for Jeremiah, it was to be a prophet, again, to the nations. Um, Jeremiah's response to that, by the way, uh, maybe we would respond somewhat similarly. Uh, Alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak I am too young. Uh, part of that sounds like Moses, remember, when Moses got called and said, I, you know, I, I've never been good at speech, although he was educated in all the wisdom and uh, knowledge of the Egyptians. He probably actually, by you know, his background and training, was more, could speak better than he indicated there. He's just trying to get out of it. <laughs> you know? uh, oh, I don't want to do this. You know? uh, I'm too young. Well, the response to that uh, is, is that God says this to him. But the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and you must say whatever I command you. And so that's his commission that, that God gives him. And his message Oh, this is, and, and again, kind of like what happened to Isaiah in the temple. Then the Lord reached out his hand touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. You see, when, when the prophet spoke uh, the words that God had given him and can say, thus saith the Lord, and when he says, thus saith the Lord, and uh, and the prophecy is a prophecy of destruction, the very speaking of the prophecy becomes part of what God uses. It's as if that message will now come to fruition. And again, in Joshua's case, it tended to be the tearing down and the overthrowing of kingdoms and nations. So uh, his message again becomes, it's a tough message. And uh, and, and this is the beginning here of the very first uh, of what he's called to his. His message will be related to this. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. I will pronounce my judgment on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshiping what their hands have made. This is the big message of Jeremiah, that God is getting ready to bring, ba the Babylonians will be his instrument, but from the north they will come, and they're going to bring destruction. And the reason is, is that the people of Israel, again, ha have abandoned uh, their relationship with God. And over and over and over again, you'll see that theme running through the book of, uh, of Jeremiah. And again, with some specificity at times uh, to, uh, to, to Jerusalem itself. Tough duty this prophet had. And not that all of them didn't have a pretty tough duty. I, I really think this was not a job you wanted to have 
unless God really called you out because most of their messages were, were like this. And, uh, and generally speaking, no, the people didn't respond to the prophets. So here, you know, from a human perspective, when we, we were talking about this at our staff meeting this week, from a human perspective, I, I would say people would have thought Jeremiah was a total failure. For 40 years, nobody listened to anything he said. And, uh, you know, he probably felt that way. We're going to see some of that in terms of when he gets really discouraged and how he responds to that. But the key is, even though he got discouraged, for 40 years he was faithful. And I can remember uh, being told early in my ministry that God has not necessarily called us to be successful from the world's perspective He's called us to be faithful. And part of the lesson of Jeremiah is constantly when he should be discouraged, when things aren't going well, when everything that he's saying is coming back upon him and, and uh, you know, it, it was just tough. He kept speaking the message that God gave him. Um, so that... that that's the big picture. Early messages, chapters 2 through 39, basically consist of a number of these kinds of messages, again, in all of these chapters, specifically targeted on Judah and on Jerusalem. So it begins with a message of judgment coming on Judah. Um, oh, this was part of his call. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem... This is what the Lord says. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they aren't gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. And that is what is getting ready to trigger what God's getting ready to do. And the kind of the classic verse in here, and so the main issue is idolatry, Literal idolatry. See, in our culture, idolatry looks different. Uh, but literal idolatry of abandoning Yahweh and uh, buying into the worship of Baal, uh, particularly the, the prophet, you'll, you'll see repeatedly uh, references to uh, people going up on the hillsides, and that's where the pagan uh, altars used to be built. And, and Baal worship, again, which we've talked about quite a bit in the past, but for those of you that might be new, Baal worship, Baal was a fertility uh, god, and the, the worship of Baal was a fertility cult, and it uh, involved sacred prostitution. And the idea was that in order for the crops to be fruitful and to bear fruit, that, that, that you would engage in uh, sexual relations often with uh, the, a priestess of the cult, in, and, and that what was supposed to come out of that was that it was supposed to um, sort of stimulate Baal to make the crops more faithful. So you not only have idolatry, but out of idolatry, you really have immorality too, and, and Jeremiah will speak to that. So the, and then this is this classic text, okay? And God speaks to him, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And so it's an image, it's like a metaphor that God gives him, that God is the source of living water. And by the way, when Jesus speaks of living water in the New Testament, He's referring back probably to this text in Jeremiah and then the idea that rather than, you know, uh, sort of living in the flow of the living water, what they've done is they've, you know, they basically have created their own religious system because it appears that along with Baal worship, they're still kind of going through the motions of the temple in Jerusalem. And, uh, and it's like, rather than, you know, depending upon that living source of life uh, and water there, that now they've dug a cistern, and, and the cistern is cracked, and it won't even hold water, meaning it's just futile, futile what they're doing. And uh, the consequence of that then, again, over and over again, we see, is that judgment is coming. And... Uh, 
Oh, okay, so that's Judah generally. Now, a little bit more specifically on Jerusalem. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, and if you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. Now, my hunch is there are people like that, but, you know, God is speaking in, in uh, uh, again, sort of the general uh, state of affairs, even in the city of Jerusalem. And, uh, and he goes on in chapter 6, kind of says the same thing. Flee for safety, people of, Gen- of Benjamin, flee from Jerusalem, for disaster looms out of the north, even terrible destruction. So the first early messages, again, are messages of judgment, and particularly, again, on Judah, and specifically on Jerusalem. And then another real early message that I think is extremely important in the book is that along with their, uh, their sin and uh, the futility of, of what they have uh, you know, bought into, in a sense, uh, they also have this false hope in religiosity. And so when you get to chapter 7, they begin, God begins to address this. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Now, what's that about? Well, you know, God obviously gave directions, uh, first of all, for the tabernacle, and then later, as David wanted to uh, make that a more permanent place of worship for the temple. Uh, the, it's, the, it's the problem of humanity, to, in a certain sense, where um, God provides something that is to facilitate something more significant. And what happens is, is the thing that is to facilitate the more important thing sort of becomes an end in and of itself. So the purpose of the temple was to facilitate worship of God Almighty. But as they've gone through, you know, the religious, you know, exercises, what do we have now? Uh, It's built around, you know, roughly a little later than 1000 BC, and now we're up around, you know, four to five hundred years later. So, you know, the people of Israel, they've been going through the motions, and basically what's happened is that the temple itself and its presence and the things that were done there, they have become almost more important than living in the right relationship with God. And, uh, you know, we, we get into that trap. You know, I mean, you know, we... Uh, you can come to church every single week and go through the motions, but if your heart isn't in the right relationship with God and you're thinking, well, look, I went to church, you know, and sort of that becomes, uh, you know, the, the reason that you think, you know, things are okay between you and the Lord, you, you've, you've missed the point. And uh, apart from that relationship with Christ, there, there's really no reason you know, to go to church. But in this context, it was the temple. And so God tells them that even though they've got the temple, they've broken their covenant with him. Uh, They've followed other gods to serve them. Both Israel and Judah have broken the covenant I made with their ancestors. And of course, that takes us all the way back uh, to Genesis chapter 12, when God enters into a covenant with Abraham that I'm going to bless you uh, and you're going to become a source of blessing and through you all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And then in relationship to the covenant, he gives them the law and, uh, and tells them, you know, here's my law and here's what I ask you uh, to do to keep this relationship uh, you know, where it needs to be. And of course, the very first part of the law is you shall have no other gods before me. And so, you know, one God, worship God, and they, and they haven't. They, they've strayed again, and they've strayed to the very things that were the reason God uh, gave, gave them the land and basically allowed them to drive out the nations before them but they've, you know, they, again, they've gotten into the same trap. And, uh, 
And the big issue, and this is a key verse, I think, in Jeremiah, what's going on in all of this is really pretty simple. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So it's an issue of the heart again. And, uh, and the reality is, I think part of the bigger message, spoiler, <laughs> you know, spoiler coming, is that we need a new heart. You know, that, that our heart has a problem in its natural state and uh, no amount, again, they can go every day to the temple. They can make sacrifices left and right. They can tie their income. They can do all of the religious stuff, but the reality is that, that there's a problem, a heart problem, and ultimately, obviously, Jesus comes to give us a new heart and to change us from the inside out. So summary of all these early chapters here uh, in Jeremiah, you could say is simply that it's bleak. I mean, he paints a very bleak picture, and as a consequence, he will constantly encounter resistance, and part of that resistance will come from the religious leaders of the day, the priests and the prophets. They're going to give false messages, but they're going to accuse him of being the false prophet. And so it's, it's really, it's kind of a bleak, uh, you know, a bleak scenario. And again, take, take away, probably similar to Isaiah, from this part of the, of the prophecy is simply judgment is coming. That's his message. The middle part of the book, uh, it contains a number of historical narratives. When he's speaking as a prophet, it's, it's written in poetic form. And so in your Bibles, normally, you see that, uh, you know, even the way that that appears in the text is poetic. But then it'll shift into a kind of normal prose. And oftentimes it shifts into prose when it's dealing with sort of a historic situation that goes on in Joshua's life. They're, they're kind of three biggies. Um, well, maybe four, and I'm not going to, I, I got to get to the good part of the book here, so I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, spend all of my time on this, but, but let me just say that uh, in, in, in chapter 20, it, there's sort of this transition that takes place. These historical narratives run from chapter 20 all the way through chapter 39, and chapter 20, Jeremiah has this uh, experience. This was Jeremiah from the Bible series, and what's on his back is a yoke there, because one of the things they're going to do to him is they're going to make him carry uh, a yoke around. Um, or was it God that made him carry the yoke around? I can't, I, I'm, having a, I'm having a senior moment here. Um, anyway, uh, the, uh, he's going to have this encounter with one of the priests at the temple. And out of that, uh, he's going to get beaten. He's going to be put in stocks. And, and he is, you know, he's really going to experience uh, persecution for this message that he's given. And after this happens, what, what we see is that we get a little bit of a uh, window into his, you know, his own heart and what's going on and how he gets discouraged. And this is called Jeremiah's complaint. That's kind of the technical term, and it's found in chapter 20. And so he's responding in the midst of this difficulty he's experiencing. And he says this, You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? That's tough stuff. And aren't you glad that, that God gives us that kind of a peek uh, into Jeremiah's heart? I think... I think to some extent, all of us feel that way sometimes, and, and particularly when you do the right thing and the outcome 
you know, is exactly the opposite, you know, of what you hoped for. You know, we, we don't get, I mean, you could say that, uh, that there is a certain amount uh, in culture as a whole today. There certainly is a, a bit of a, a negative bent against, uh, you know, people of Christian faith particularly. And we see it in a lot of areas, but, but we don't generally go through what Jeremiah went through. But, but when we're feeling discouraged about following Christ, remember Jeremiah, and, and the result is that he gives the complaint, but he keeps going. He keeps going, he stays faithful. And, and by the way, one of the titles uh, that Jeremiah is known by is sometimes he's called the weeping prophet. Because again, he, he you know, he, he got discouraged. Um, uh, so... Anyway, this is the first experience. Uh, chapter 26, he has another experience. He prophesies the destruction of the temple. Um, this is during the period, we're told, of Jehoiakim. So it's, again, it's uh, after Josiah, but it's not till the end of the period yet. And the outcome is, is that now the priests and prophets want to put him to death. And, and in that experience where he's put on trial, uh, actually uh, others intervene and, and he is spared. And then in chapter 28, kind of a key one, gosh, I got to, okay, I'm going to go quick here. Um, in chapter 28, he, he has this encounter with one of the prophets, the prophets, you know, of, of Jerusalem. It takes place during the reign of Zedekiah. This was Zedekiah in the Bible series. And, and basically, this prophet uh, gives this following prophecy in, early in the reign of Zedekiah. Here we'll go. Right. This, and the prophet is saying, this is the false prophet saying this. Okay? So when he says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, God doesn't say this. And so what the false prophet says is this, that I will break uh, the yoke of the king of Babylon. In other words, the Babylon's going to be defeated within two years. I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiachin. He was the king at the time of the actual exile. He was taken into exile and Zedekiah was made the king. So I will bring back Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So the prophecy is this. God's going to break Babylon. He's going to defeat Babylon. It's going to take place within two years. The king will be returned to Jerusalem, and all the exiles will be returned. And Jeremiah has to confront him, because Jeremiah knows God didn't say that, because Jeremiah knows what God had said to him. And, and so Jeremiah comes back and says this, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, yet you have persuaded this nation to trust in lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. This is not a prophecy you want to get, by the way, about yourself. Okay? Uh, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This very year, you are going to die because you have preached rebellion against the Lord. And five months later, this is what happens. In the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah the prophet died. And so, false prophecy given there. And then... And then we're, we're given this kind of classic text. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens. This is in Babylon he's talking about. Eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams uh, you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. And then he gives the timetable. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. 
And of course, this, if you could, this is kind of cool, this is what Daniel's reading in the book of Daniel, wondering about the timetable, because he's read Jeremiah, it says 70 years, and obviously 70 years are approaching, and Daniel wants to know, hey, you know, what, what's happening? And in response to that, he gets a very specific timetable we'll look at when we get into Daniel. And then classic text. Some of you, I know, probably, you love this text, and, and you, you know, we, we apply it to ourselves, which I, don't, I think is fine, but the context is that it's in this context that God, oh, shoot. I hope I didn't lose that. Oh, no, 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 okay, it's, it, it's later. I, I, I held it off for the good part. Okay, I got five minutes for the good part. Okay, all right, okay. Let, let, let's real quickly, because uh, this is great. Now, part two, kind of after the fall of Jerusalem, just to sort of give some structure here. First of all, the fall itself is described in chapter 39. It's also described somewhat in chapter 52. And in the text, we're simply told that it takes place the ninth year of Zedekiah, that Nebuchadnezzar now marches. He's, Zedekiah has rebelled against Babylon, and he's led the people to rebel. They think they're going to break Babylon. They listen to the false prophets. And in the ninth year of Zedekiah, uh, which was um, 589 B.C., uh, 589, 588, uh, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to the city of Jerusalem. He, he lays siege to it for two years. Basically, that meant nobody could get in, nobody could get out. Uh, people begin to starve. Uh, people literally begin to cannibalize each other. I mean, it's, it's brutal what happens. And then in the 11th year, two years later, they break through the walls. And you probably know some of the story uh, from earlier, uh, and, uh, and they do this scene in the Bible story, but Zedekiah flees, uh, they find him, and when they find him, they take him uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar executes his two sons in front of him, and then gouges his eyes out and takes him to Babylon in chains. And what happens, of course, is that uh, uh, wall's broken through. What happens is that... Uh, you know, that's about Zedekiah. Uh, what happens is that uh, the city is set on fire, the temple is set on fire, the entire city is destroyed, and the rest of the nobility are taken into exile, and a very poor remnant are left behind. So I'm going to go, I'm going to jump ahead here to uh, hope. There are messages of hope in the book. You know, in the midst of all of this bad news, there, there are, there's some good news. There's three big messages of hope in the book, and we'll, this will finish our time this morning. The first is that there is hope that they are going to return from captivity. And there are promises of this throughout the book, chapter 25, chapter 30, chapter 33, promises. Kind of one of the, the great little texts is that in the midst of knowing there's going to be destruction, but I'm going to bring you back here, that's when God gives this promise. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And God's going to do that. He's going to bring them back. The temple will be rebuilt. Uh, the walls of the city will be rebuilt. And ultimately, that becomes the Jerusalem that Jesus uh, comes to during his ministry. So return from captivity. Um, the second message of hope is of the coming of Messiah. Just a hint, not like Isaiah, where they were very specific. But, but there are hints here. And, and, and chapter 33 says this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll fulfill the good word which I've spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. So it's a, it's a promise of the coming of Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And then the great, I think this is the best part of the whole book, and and I'm out of time. Uh, everything else was my introduction to this particular point. No, just kidding. Uh, a promise of a new covenant. And Jeremiah is the prophet that gives this 
critical promise. And, and it's just great. Behold, the days are coming. This is what Biff read for uh, Call to Worship, declares the Lord. When I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of uh, Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, really the covenant of the law, okay, external do these things, okay? But they broke it, they couldn't keep it. Although I was a husband to them, uh, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And so, oh, I think maybe one more verse. Yes, yeah. they won't teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And it's that passage in Jeremiah that in the upper room, Jesus refers back to about what is getting ready to happen on the cross of Christ. And, and Jesus simply takes the cup and says this, this is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And Christ then fulfills the prophecy of hope of God giving a whole new covenant that rather than being external religiosity is internal spiritual reality where God internally, of course, Christ by the Holy Spirit invades our life and gives us the ability to live in that kind of a dynamic relationship with him. I think the takeaway from this is simply this, that God's plans, they're continuing to unfold. I mean, all of Route 66 of the Old Covenant, it all is a journey to Jesus. And then we hit the New Covenant. That's just what, this is what your Bibles, Old Covenant, New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament. We hit Jesus, and then from Jesus forward, the Bible is a journey with Jesus. So that's, that's, you know, if someone says, what's the Bible about? Well, the Old Testament is a journey to Jesus. Anyway, okay. I think that's pretty good stuff. Anyway, all right. So ultimately fulfilled on the cross. One final message uh, of Jeremiah. It is a lament over the destruction of Jerusalem. And that is our next stop on Route 66. I will be here next Sunday and we will work through the book of Lamentations. All right. Let's pray, and then Biff, you can come do a song. Let's, I'll do the benediction. All right. Let's stand together. Uh, well, Lord, I, I just pray that as we contemplate the things that you have said uh, to Jeremiah, you know, there's times, Lord, when we read through this book, and you can't help but sort of think about our own country and, uh, and, and how you had a plan and a purpose for us, and certainly we feel like it's just deviated so much. And Lord, uh, you know, I, I remember the Billy Graham saying that if you didn't judge America, that you owed Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. We, we don't want to be destroyed, Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to move in our land and you, you use us, Lord, to, uh, to reach out to folks and, uh, Lord, to share the good news and that, and that the winds of revival would sweep over our country and, and we would repent and turn back to you. Uh, Lord, unlike what we see in the book of Jeremiah. And thank you for the hope uh, that you give us in that book. Thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for Jesus. We are just so grateful, Lord. And I just pray that as we leave this place this morning, Lord, you would, you, you would bless our body, uh, that the Lord would keep you and make his face shine on you. He'd be gracious to you. He'd lift up the light of his countenance upon you, and he would give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.